couple of things uh, as we get started. If there are times that uh, I seem to be a little bit subdued, it's because I don't, <laughs> I can't hear very well this morning. Uh, the Passion Play, Scott brought that up, and I don't know, how many of you came to the Passion Play, by the way? Okay, great majority of you. Yeah. Special thank you to, to Julia and Ellen and Kenny and Nancy and Sue and Michael and Alex and Devin and I hope I'm not missing anybody. I'm sure I am. The choir, the choir did a great job. What? Yeah, actually, I was going to say the. Yeah, the reason I, my left ear is completely clogged right now because they use this uh, makeup on us for the blood. It's a powder, and that powder is just—it's like caused havoc in my life. I, <coughs> I went home the next day. And in the morning, the next morning, I got up and I blew my nose and there was blood. And I'm like, what is going on? Well, it was the powder. You know, I breathed it in and, and whatever it touches that is uh, moist, it turns to blood. And so right now I have a, I think I have a big old hunk of dried blood <laughs> in my ear. And uh, no, no. I, I, I think maybe someone said I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, it's okay. I mean, I can't hear you, so that's a good thing. Maybe this is an answered prayer, Jane, that I can't hear the hecklers in the front. Uh, so anyway, uh, if I seem to be a little bit subdued, it's only because of that. I just don't want to get too loud. Uh, with with things so uh, let me introduce the message in this way um, I, we are here this morning to celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen but at the same time um, that that means a response from us and uh, and so the, the message I cho- have chosen is is taken from Matthew chapter 7 we're going to be looking at uh, verses 13 and 14 and and uh, and I want you to understand what what Scott shared is is, is very very accurate. Um, there's not there's not a one of us who are uh, in any different situation when it comes to our relationship with the Father. You know, it doesn't make any difference if you're a, a minister or an elder or, you know, a Sunday school teacher in the church or someone who's just for the first time maybe visiting here at Crossroads or any other congregation. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And, and, and whether you realize this or not, and this is important because some of you are going to think, man, he, he was nailing me this morning. And, and to be honest with you, I hope that I spread that wealth a little bit. Because I want, I want it to affect us all. And that's the whole point of this message. Um, that the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is meant to make a difference. And as you progress in the path with him, that difference sometimes is even greater than what you're asked to give at the very beginning. So, so understand that, that, that the challenge is meant to hit us all. And I hope that you see that as we go through these two verses. Um, in, order, in order, though, to set it up, hey, there's one other thing I want to tell you. It, wasn't it kind of nice this morning? Um, for those of you who usually come to the 8 o'clock service, wasn't it kind of nice this morning? Didn't you feel kind of lazy today? I could get used to this. Uh, yeah, but, you know, we go back to the normal thing next week. But, uh, but uh, you know, I'm glad that you're all here, and, and we tried to make it a convenient time. Uh, some of you who may be hearing me preach for the first time, I do preach for a while. Um, but it's, I've often told people that I'm, I'm really not on any time constraint except God's. And, and, uh, and, and whenever I... I love what Verniel Guerin used to say. I'll tell you... 
I'll tell you whenever I'm starting, and I'll tell you whenever it's over, okay? And uh, so that's, you know, just kind of bear with me. Um, you know, you'll, you'll get to the dinner in plenty of time uh, this morning. All right, uh, I want to begin with this statement from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I put a lot of thought into what I would share this Easter morning of 2014. And to be honest, this past week has been full of a lot of emotion for me. And I cannot, I can't not be impacted in a great way participating in the, the passion play. One of the things that you guys may not know is in that rehearsal that we do over the six weeks or so, there's actually a lot of joking that goes on. I mean, a, a lot of joking. We have to. And especially in the position that I play, I've been typecast as a Roman guard. It's like the big heavy guys get to do that job. But it's amazing to watch the transformation that takes place throughout. And, and we have to joke around a little bit because if we didn't, we would be so overwhelmed with the emotion each and every time, you know. I remember we were standing over here and and please, please understand this. This is not meant to be disrespectful. It's not meant to be sacrilegious at all. But I remember standing over here in the scene before Caiaphas, and I'm standing next to Robbie during one of the rehearsals, and I know I'm about to push him to the floor, and then I'm about to jerk him back up on his feet again after the crowd gets finished with him. <laughs> and I lean over to Robbie, and I, I smell his hair. <laughs> and I say, you, you use Perk Plus, don't you? See, we had to do things like that because, because when it comes to the night of the performances, it is so emotionally draining. I mean, when the guards finish with Jesus, you know, bringing him down and putting him on the cross and, and raising him up, when we go backstage, we are done. We're done. You know, this, this week is just full of that type of emotion, you know, rehearsals and dress rehearsal and, and the two performances. And so we try to keep things lighthearted. And, and I, for one, have to have that because otherwise I would be overwhelmed with the emotion. Because, folks, I, I am in so much awe of God's love, aren't you? His love for us. I'm amazed at the measure and the extent of his love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And yet, while I'm stunned with the truth of God's love for man, I'm so greatly humbled by the fact that he is a righteous and a holy judge as well. And, 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 and I really believe that on mornings like this, that goes understated. That he is righteous and he is holy. And it's his righteousness and his holiness and our lack of righteousness. There is no one righteous, no, not one. It is the fact that we were sinners, that that's that great void. And Jesus loved us, God loved us enough to send Jesus for us. And I am utterly amazed that he loves us like that. That even when we were the ones to blame, he acted I'm greatly humbled by the fact that he's a righteous and holy judge. He is creator God, the only being worthy of being called good and right, the author and the perfecter of our souls. Our God has no beginning, neither does he have an ending. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He alone has been and always will be. There is no one before him, and oh, how he loves you. So what do you give the God who is and has everything? You give him your life. You give him your heart, your mind, your soul. You give him your all. 
That's what God desires, and it's also what He deserves. Life given back to the Creator. And so we come to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to go back and look at the entire sermon, and I'm going to try to be very brief with that, but I want to read these words first, and then we'll come back to them as we go throughout the message. Jesus says in this conclusion, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. The small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. As I said, this is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, which some have described as the greatest discourse that's ever been preached. And since the one who delivers the message is none other than Jesus, I would have to agree with that assessment. This is the greatest message to ever have been presented Now, before we look at those words in detail, I really feel the need to offer just a brief summary of just what Jesus' sermon is about, because there are many individuals who look at this text, or look at these three chapters, and they describe his teaching as being scattered and disconnected, and yet, uh, upon a close examination of Jesus' thoughts, there's no doubt that such criticism is not only unwarranted, but it's just wrong. Um... They're very connected. Jesus came with a purpose. He came with a mission. We've celebrated that this morning. Up from the grave he arose. Because of us, the ones who are to blame, Jesus died. That's the mission that he followed through with. But he came preaching and teaching. And and his call to each one of us is to follow him. To follow his will. To follow his way. To follow his standard and that's what this message this sermon on the mount is really all about jesus came preaching the kingdom of god there is a new kingdom that has come and it is in the hands of the father and jesus described to us in these three chapters what that kingdom looks like and what it does matthew explains that when jesus saw the crowds if you want to turn back to chapter five When he saw the crowds, Jesus went up on the side of a mountain and he sat down. And when he sat down, he began to teach them. And what he teaches is the arrival of the kingdom of God. In the Beatitudes, Jesus offers a a description of those who are citizens of his kingdom. That's really what the Beatitudes are about. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And on through verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. What he does is he describes what the kingdom looks like, what the disciples should look like. He then offers the roles that we're to fulfill as citizens of God's kingdom when he says that we are to be the salt and the light to the rest of the world. Salt which purifies and light which penetrates. Jesus says that that's what the disciples will do and should do, those who are part of the kingdom. The next section of the sermon describes keeping God's commands. And since this kingdom belongs to God, he alone gets to make the rules. I I run into people all the time who, who like to follow up anything that they read in Scripture with this one little word, three letters, but. I know what it says, but. And let me, let me if, you, if you don't take away anything else, then understand this about the kingdom of God, about being his disciple. He is God. You are not. He gets to make the rules. It's interesting that Jesus makes clear his mission is not to do away with any part of the law, but rather that through him the entire law would be fulfilled. And that's wonderful news because he's the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can live up to it. It should also be noted that Jesus actually raises the standard here. What he says is, you have, six times he says, uses these words, you have heard it said, do not kill or do not murder. 
do not commit adultery. But what Jesus does is he raises the standard and he says to you and to me that it's not just about what's on the outside because the Pharisees prided themselves in that. Look at my outside. Look at how I act. Look at what I do. And, and yet in, inwardly they were committing adultery every day. Inwardly they were murdering someone. Even outwardly sometimes because in their criticism they were actually tearing the character of people, of people down. And by doing that, they were committing character assassination. They were killing people's reputations. And so Jesus says, I want to tell you that it's more than just about the outward action. It's about what's in your heart. It's about what's in your mind. And so he raises the standard of the law six times. He begins with those words. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you the standards of God's kingdom are not simply outward physical prohibitions but they take in the whole person and what he says is it's a much as much about the heart and mind as it is about action and behavior then in chapter 6 Jesus reveals the kingdom life also requires certain actions it's not simply about prohibition but it's about Carrying out certain actions, caring for those in need, being in prayer with the Father, honoring Him with our lives through fasting and investing in kingdom work. Next, Jesus addresses our anxiety and He addresses our dependence upon the Father, noting that we should learn to let God be God in matters of judgment and providence and that none of us should judge others but allow God to be that holy and righteous judge. And so now in chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus begins to conclude this great sermon that he said, this is the kingdom, this is what it looks like, this is what it does. These are the attitudes of the people within the kingdom, those who follow me. Martin Lloyd-Jones offers this thought. He says, Jesus says, there is the kingdom of God. Now, what are you going to do with it? That's really the essence of this message there is the kingdom of God now what are you going to do with it and don't miss this because Jesus expects each one of us to do something with it James the brother of our Lord um, later offers these words from his epistle in James 1 22 he says do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves but do what it says. Can I tell you that the church in the United States has become a people who are quite comfortable with listening to the word, but there are few who do what it says. We have the same problem today that has always been. We're a people who love to listen, but when it comes to doing what it says, well, we leave that to other people. There are others who are more dedicated than I. The Lord knows that I'm kind of flighty with my faith. And so, but praise God that he loves me. Praise God. Praise God that Jesus wasn't flighty with his faith. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount has presented the truth about the kingdom of God. What it is, what it does, who it involves. And he builds all of this towards this great crescendo. And he says, do something with it. But Miles, are you, are you sure that that's what he's saying? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. You see, he wraps this all up with four contrasts. We're going to talk about one of those contrasts today, the two paths. But he also talks about two trees. You guys remember the two trees? One tree produces fruit, the other does not. He, he contrasts two confessions he says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of the Father. And he contrasts two builders. And then in verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock yep I'm certain Jesus says put it into practice do something with it 
Here's my kingdom, now do what it says. And here is a truth that some of you need to hear and take away with you. In your life, when the wind blows and the rains come down and the storms begin to threaten, everything falls apart because you have not built and do not live on the rock. You, you like the story and you listen and you come to worship from time to time, but you have not, you have not and are not putting his words into practice it really is that simple. But I want you to notice that never does Jesus say that it's easy. Kingdom life is not easy, but it's simple. Do what Jesus says. Amen? Do what he says. And so he says here, enter Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You know, I was on my way here this morning, and, uh, and, and, and as you guys came in, I'm sure you saw, I, I saw people out for a morning walk. I saw people already at riches or uh, well, I didn't drive by past the golf course but I'm sure you're right they were golfing you know and I thought to myself wide is the gate that leads to destruction wide is that road and, and many find it you see, Jesus tells us exactly what you and I need to do as his followers. He says, enter through the narrow gate. By, by the way, God has always presented relationship with him in this simple, straightforward manner. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, Moses says to the people, the day I call, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life so that you and your children may live. God has always been direct and simple about it. Choose life, God says to the children of Israel. Joshua, as he's led them into the promised land and as he's beginning to um, prepare to depart from the world, he says to his people in Joshua twenty four fifteen, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It, it, it's always been that simple. And even in the psalm that I began with, Psalm 1, 1 through 6, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prosper prospers not so the wicked they are like chaff that the wind blows away therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous for the lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish it's simple but not easy and so we're going to examine this passage two gates two paths two crowds and two destinations. And hopefully somewhere in this message it hits you wherever you are in, in the midst of the decision to follow Christ. The gates. Jesus says there, there are two gates. One is narrow, one is wide. And he even instructs us if we're going to follow him that we have to enter through the narrow gate. And so what he basically is saying there is that when you make that decision to follow him, you have to be intentional. You have to be looking for this gate. You have to be searching and seeking for this gate. That's what he says. Seek, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be taken care of. I don't know why it is that we always feel like, God, you take care of the spiritual part of this, and then I'll take care of the rest of my life. And yet that's how many, many of us believe and, and we, we, we live. But he says, seek first God's kingdom. Be intentional. Look for this gate. Jesus said, in this life there are two gates before us. 
in, in, in determining our lifestyles, which gate we enter through. One gate is broad or wide, and most people choose to enter living this life through it. In fact, one could make a good case that this gate is our default entry into the world, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And so there's probably some truth that when we enter into this life, the default gate is the wide gate. We're all on that path. All of us are introduced into this life by the wide gate, but Jesus shares about another gate, one that isn't found accidentally, but intentionally. A gate that must be sought, and once we find it, we enter into the kingdom life. And of course, what he's speaking about is himself. As he later mentions in the Gospel of John, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me And I believe that one of the major obstacles for the church in the United States is the assumption that we've grown up as believers, that we live in a Christian nation. You ask a person, are you a Christian? And they answer probably in one of three ways. They say, first of all, of course I'm a Christian. I go to church most of the time, and, and I make sure that I'm there on the big days. You know, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty good person, so yeah, yeah, of course I'm a, a Christian. Someone else will answer in this way. They'll say, uh, well, actually, I better give my response, I guess, to that, hadn't I? They say I go to church, and so my response might be something like this. Let me just get this straight. You, you think that those are the things that make you a Christian or a follower of Jesus. So, so what do you do with what he says in verses 21 through 23 when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What do you do with that? Do you think that his will is simply that you attend worship on a Sunday morning and maybe you hit Wednesday nights every once in a while you see what Jesus says is that there will be people who are present here every time the doors are open there will be those who are only here occasionally there will be some who call themselves followers who watch Joel Osteen or John Hagee or Charles Stanley faithfully from week to week on television but that doesn't make them Christian a disciple what well, what does make them a disciple? Doing the will of the Father, living out Jesus' words. Bringing into your life all those things that we just kind of briefly touched on. What it is to be a disciple, what it looks like, what, we, what our purpose is. Working on our hearts and our minds as much as we do on the outward action. That's doing the will of the Father. When the Father says you need to change this in your life, that you listen and you change it. Others will answer this way, of course I'm a Christian. I was raised in a Christian home. No, no disrespect here, but I didn't ask you whether your parents or your grandparents were Christians. I asked if you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And then some, this is my favorite, of course I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian all of my life. Folks, that is a theological impossibility. And yet, there's so many in this country who are, who, are, who are caught up in that. I'm an American. Of course I'm a Christian. I've met a lot of Americans who are not Christians. And I've met even more Christians who are not Americans. Unfortunately, that's exactly what, every, or what a lot of people believe. Jesus makes it clear that you do not enter this gate accidentally. You don't enter this gate by default. Each one of us enters intentionally. Psalm 51.5 reads, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Because there has to be a point of repentance. There has to be a point of faith. But our culture ignores this and has attempted to make it easy. I have to admit to you that last night I had a hard time sleeping. I always do. 
before service like this. Always do second guessing what God has laid on my heart to share. And I watched Joel Osteen. For those in the, in the back, you can't see me quickly blinking my eyes. <coughs> Brother Joel. And at the end of it, this is what he did. And this is just perfect illustration. By the way, I have been, always been taught that someone who blinks their eyes that rapidly is not being truthful. Now, don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand. Um, I, I'm not saying that he's not a great encourager. Hey, I, I listen to a lot of people that tell me that they encourage him, or he encourages them. But here's my problem. I don't think he really believes what he's preaching. Here's the one thing I'll tell you. I fully believe what I'm preaching. Now, understand this. That doesn't mean that I always put it into practice but I'm willing to tell you that. And and I also want to tell you this, just since we're on the subject of Joel Osteen. I know you didn't bring him up. I brought him up. But but can I tell you something? Anybody who believes that we're going to have our best life here is wrong. Our best life is before us. Our best life. Think about this. When, When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, have you ever thought about this? Do you think Lazarus was actually happy to be back? You know? I don't. You know, I I think Lazarus probably laid in there and go, leave me alone. I was tired of Martha and Mary anyway. I mean, they're my sisters. I love them, but I was so tired of them. I I would bet that he, he was like, don't, man, don't bring me back to this. You know one of my favorite parts? Do you guys realize that later on, the Jewish leaders came to Lazarus and said to him, if you don't quit talking about Jesus, we're going to kill you. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I mean, really, I mean, I, 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 cliches, cliches kind of bug me, but this is a great cliche to use there. Lazarus probably looked at them, and let me get this straight. If I don't stop talking about Jesus, you're going to kill me. Yeah. Well, I've been there. And I've done that. Knock yourself out. I mean, really, he understood that our best life isn't here. It's then. It's, it's whenever we cross over. Listen, we, we have had a very difficult start to this year. We have lost a lot of, I mean, we have lost a lot of people, people who have gone home to be with the Lord. And if I could tell their families anything this morning, Embrace what we're celebrating. Jesus rose from the dead victorious so that your loved ones, they are now in a place, and as much as they love you, they're they're having their best life right now. But we we try to make it so easy. So at the end of Joel's message last night, he said, we never want to leave without an opportunity for you all to accept the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So right now, wherever you are, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. And so please rescue me from this sin. And can I tell you something? Jesus will do that. But where is the repentance? Where is the faith? Where is the changed life? Jesus said, Jesus said to the woman caught in the act of adultery, now here's the deal. I want you to go and I want you to not do this anymore. We have made it too easy. And please hear me again. It's simple, but it is not easy because Jesus demands that there be changes in you. And I don't know what we are. He hung on a cross, beaten, suffering, 
If you guys had a chance this past week, a couple of different times they showed the passion of the Christ. And, and when, the, when, the, when the centurion comes back into the courtyard after they've beaten Jesus, do you remember that he balls them out because he says, I didn't mean for you to beat him to death. That's how much he suffered. And, and, then, and then we want to argue with what he wants from us. He died for us. And, and yet we'll argue, well, Lord, you can have this, but I'm going to hang on to this. You can have this part of me, but this part I'm going to hang on to. And who do we think we are? We make it so easy. There's no challenge to live differently. There's no challenge to live counterculturally. In fact, you go on pursuing the same things everyone else does. Comfort and ease. Don't worry about pleasing God. Make yourself happy and carry out your will in this life. Have your best life now and call it discipleship. Two gates. And Jesus says it's real simple. Enter through the narrow one. I don't want you to miss this. Enter through the narrow gate. Once you enter through the narrow gate, there's two paths, Jesus says. Two paths. One that is wide and it leads to destruction. Many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. I love that word narrow in the Greek text. What it literally means is that it's a pressed down road. I don't mean that it's an asphalt road or a paved road. I, I mean what he says is it's a pressured road. That's what he means by narrow. There's pressure here. If you enter through the narrow gate, your life will be changed. It will be affected. And honestly, it doesn't mean that it will be easier. Christians still get cancer and they die. We still face financial struggles and we still get lonely. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus invites those who are weary and burdened to come to him. His promise is one of rest. And he says, take my yoke upon you before, because my yoke is easy. And I'll tell you why it's an easy yoke. His yoke is easy because it is a shared one. What Jesus promises is that he will share the burdens and the struggles with you. It is a double yoke that he says that he will come alongside. Jesus says there are certain things that I can take from you. Things like your sin and your guilt. There are things that I can give you. I can give you forgiveness and mercy. I can give you the love of the Almighty Father. I can, I can present to you joy and peace and while certain burdens may remain, my promise is that you will not bear them alone. I love the fact that Jesus never hides the struggle. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus states those who follow him will be persecuted. Um, Matthew 5, 10 through 12, he said, blessed are the persecuted. Paul shares those wor these words in 2 Timothy 3.12. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's no wonder that Jesus says only a few find this path. Because most don't want to deal with the pressures, the path. I can't tell you the number of people in this church, in this congregation, and many other congregations who come to an acceptance of Jesus, but the part that they have a hard time with is when things start getting tough along the path. And then what happens? Two things, one of two things happens. You either turn towards God and the church and you embrace them even more tightly, or you walk away. And sadly, so many people walk away. The Apostle John shares in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. My wife gave me a reminder this week. You know, one of the toughest things as a, as a preacher is the desire to be liked. The desire to be liked. Even when there are moments when there are things that we have to do where we will not be liked. 
the desire to be liked, the desire to please people. That's there in every minister that I know. And so we were talking the other night. You know, I remember a time whenever we would have our Easter services at Bismarck Junior High School and there would be 900 people there. And so when we moved into this building, you know, we had, I think we had 950 at one time here in the building. That's hard to believe, but I don't think we had that wall back there at that time. And, but then as we went along and we began to get down to the business of making disciples, what, it, what we started to see was that people would fall off. And, you know, and the encouraging thing is that um, in services like this, sometimes we see some old faces that were back. And, but I got to tell you that there were times that it's really discouraging. And, and Jesus reminded me of something which made me think of this verse. And that is that the people who have left this congregation, I mean, the people who have left, I don't mean people who are on the fringe. The people who have left, they weren't with us to begin with. Now, I'm not making a judgment on them. They may, they may find someplace else where they serve, and they serve in a great capacity. God bless them, and I mean that. But there are some who've left, and, and, and the truth is, they, they never were his to begin with. And that's what John is saying. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. And so what Jennifer said to me is, why do you spend so much energy and time worrying about those who really didn't belong in the first place? Out of the, uh, out of the mouths of babes and wives come great wisdom. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. And those are really sad words to me. Discourage people who leave the path, maybe because others have not been honest about the struggle, and they presented it in such an easy way. Maybe because they never really entered the narrow gate to begin with. They, they never really ever came in. Well, there are two crowds. Two gates, two paths, two crowds. And the two crowds represent enduring patiently, waiting patiently for the Lord's return. Can you imagine if Lazarus, you know, after the Lord... Because here's what most people don't really realize. Um... Lazarus was raised from the dead about a week before Jesus was crucified. Okay? In fact, nine days later, Jesus was resurrected. And, and, and maybe years down the road, Lazarus and Mary and Martha are sitting around and they're waiting. They're waiting for the Lord's return. As Jesus ascended, the angel said, why do you stand here watching this and, and waiting here? He, he's already told you that he's going to return in like manner. And so the, the people are, are waiting. And, and for, for anyone who is waiting, I, I imagine it was harder on Lazarus than anyone. It's simply because of what we talked about. He understood what was to come. And so he sits around and, and they wait. Patiently they endure I don't mind spending time alone. Solitude is a beautiful thing. In fact, I've often thought about how much easier it might be to serve God if it weren't for people. <laughs> I, I've not been alone in that, by the way. There's a whole, there was a whole movement and still is within Catholicism um, of monasticism, you know, the, the monks who go out and they take a vow of solitude and live by themselves. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. Jesus says that we're called to live intentionally. We're called to live purposefully right in the midst of the other crowd. 
That, that's the thing I, I, I don't think I really understood until I started preparing this message this morning. This narrow pathway that we are on, it is made more difficult because the narrow pathway, you see, sometimes, sometimes we get the idea, you know, I, I don't remember who wrote this, but you remember the guy that wrote, said, I, I was taking a, a walk in the woods one day and I came upon two paths. And I decided, well, who was it? Thank you. I thought that was who it was. I, I really did. This isn't like a Jeopardy thing, you know, or <laughs> the answer comes up. and you know, I knew that. Uh, Robert Frost wrote the, you know, and, and I don't even know the right words, but I do know this. He said, I decided to take the road less traveled. See, it's, it's not really like that. This narrow pathway that we're on is in the midst of the broad path. See, there are the pressures because we live and we work among people who are on the broad path. And some of them sound and look like really good people. And what they do is they, they try to tell us what they think. We're right in the midst of the other crowd. We are called to be as witnesses, not by hiding behind stained glass windows, but by going out there. There's a parable in Matthew chapter 13 where uh, the workers go out and sow wheat in a field. And in the night, an enemy comes and sows weeds among the wheat. And then the, the, the landowner is asked this question. Do we, do we go and pluck up the, the weeds? And the answer is no. Let them grow together. Therein is our struggle. There are two crowds. There are the few who follow. And there are the many who surround us. And who call to us. God asks us to live and be in a world that is so different from his character. And so we face constant pressures and temptations to fold. There are a lot of people who want to see us fail. And oh, they would never tell you that because they are far more subtle and they masquerade as well-meaning good people. So they tell you and share with you their ideas and thoughts about who God is and what God wants and how far you can actually stray and people listen to that. They hear it. They embrace it. Yeah, you can serve God, but don't you think you deserve some stuff along the way? Oh, I know you're a believer and you want your kids to grow up as, as believers, but this travel team will only keep you gone on, on what, eight or nine Sundays. That's, that's all. I mean, come on. God doesn't expect you to have the same kind of faith as the minister. That's what they tell you. The world lines itself up with the ideas that they are smarter than God is, and some of you are buying it. God desires a people who will live intentionally, purposefully, and who will endure with Him patiently. Do you understand? Life with Him means that you will live His way. It is about asking the Almighty, what do you want from me this day? It is about realizing that He holds in His hands the next breath that you take. And you can do nothing without him and without his permission. It's not about what you want. It's not about what your kids want. It is about, it's not about what your neighbor wants. It is only about what the almighty God, the creator and the provider, the redeemer, it's what he wants. That's what we need to be asking today. Lord, what, what do you want? Every morning should begin with that question to yourself. Oh, we love to extend that question to everyone else. 
every other believer that we know, and especially those who are our leaders. Let, let me tell you what the Lord wants from you, brother. Well, let me tell you that unless the Lord has extended that to me first, and all that you're doing is giving a confirmation, it's probably what you want from me and not what he wants. Now, some of you could do with that, the same thing with that this morning. You could say, well, I don't really feel like God is leading me to this, but then you'll be arguing with Scripture, not me. Because it's what he desires, living intentionally, purposefully, and enduring with him patiently until the end. Francis Chan, I listened to him speak, and, and, and this has become my prayer, by the way. I pray that when it's my time to go home, that I will go home doing this. Whether it's preaching at a funeral somewhere or performing someone's wedding or preaching or teaching, I pray that God takes me home. Now, I'm not in a hurry. Pray that it's not today. Because I think it so well illustrates the fact that He holds our lives in His hands. He is God. He sets the rules. He sets the standard. He deserves the glory. And we glorify Him when we live in His will. Chan illustrated that, by the way, with two stories. One was a pastor who was preaching at a funeral, and he just finished. He just finished saying to the congregation who was there that the man who is in this casket today, I can confidently tell you, is before the Lord now simply because I was the one who led him to the Lord. Now, all he's saying is, I led him to the Lord. The Lord did the work. And if he's in heaven, it's not because of his goodness. It's not because of the great father that he was or the great husband that he was or the great business mind that he had. That's not why he's in heaven. He is in heaven because he put his trust and his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he repented of his sins and he walked with him for the remainder of his days. That's why. He's in heaven because of Jesus. And some of you, he says, need to embrace Christ in that same way because without him you have no hope. It makes no difference how good you think you are, how smart you think you are, how much money you think you have accumulated and, and earned. It's not about all that. It is about trust in Jesus. And he sat down and he died. Chan, Chan said that when he went to the house later the after, that afternoon, family and friends, neighbors had gathered there, and his wife looked at him and said, Francis, tell us something. And I love what Francis told him. Or told, told them. He said, I'm reminded of the passage of Scripture which says that if you confess me before men, then I will confess you before the Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, then I will deny you before the Father in heaven. And he went on to say this. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Joe's surprise whenever he was just preaching at a funeral service and saying to the people, here's, here it is. Here's the kingdom and here's what you need to decide. Here's what you need to do with it. Enter through the narrow gate. His name is Jesus. And he was confessing Jesus before men and in the next second he's standing before almighty God and Jesus is next to him with his arm around him saying father this is Joe he confessed us before men and so now I confess him before you don't you want that 
I do. I want those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And people can think, man, it's just talk, but I'm telling you, he had, the next example that he used was a, a recording of a, of a disc jockey in Southern California who was talking about how God gives us every breath that we breathe, that it's God who calls us home, and that he'll never call us home before he's finished. Can, can you, before he's finished with us, can, can you take that with you too? Those of you who fear death, can you understand that if you're a believer, then he's never going to take you home before it's your time? When he's finished. No one ever dies young. They die at God's appointed time. And in his appointed way. And so this, this jockey was saying, I could go out on the 210 this afternoon on my motorcycle because you all know I ride a motorcycle. And even with all the precautions that I take, some of you are just idiots. And you cut across the diamond lane and you cut me off and, and I could be just scattered across that highway. But all that is is my physical tent. That's my body. My spirit will already have gone home to be with the Lord. And Chan went on to say, here's what happened. Two hours after that broadcast, he went out. He got on his motorcycle. He went on to the 210, and someone cut across, and he was killed that afternoon. Now, there will be, there will be folks this morning who say, well, that wasn't all that uplifting. But I beg to differ. I beg to differ because what Jesus says is that there are people here this morning who need to enter into that narrow gate intentionally. Not pressured, but intentionally. And by the way, I know of a, of a couple of people who, are, who have already made that decision. This past week, they've made that decision to enter those gates. It means for some of you who've entered those gates and have not been so purposeful with following him that what you need to do is start to live on purpose. Can I make a suggestion? Some people will say, choose a church. Choose a church and begin to worship there. Find someone who will tell the truth and tell you that it's, it's simple, but it's not easy because this is not an easy way of life. Some of you need to make that choice today. Some of you need the reminder that we are, endure, we are enduring patiently as we wait for the Lord. But I can tell you this, he's kept every other promise, and so I'm confident that he'll keep this one. He's coming back. He's taking us home. And that leads to the two destinations. He says one is destruction, and one is life. And so it's set before you this day. Which will you choose? Blessings or cursings? Life or death? The wide or the narrow? Jesus, even in the moment when he was probably at his weakest, which is right here in the garden, I've been to that place near Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, Gethsemane. It was there that he was at his weakest. The Bible says that when he was at that point, he was sweating great drops of blood. The stress was that heavy. See, Jesus was about to do something that Jesus was never intended to do. 
because Jesus was God in the flesh. He was never intended to die. The Bible says that it's appointed unto man for every man that there's a day that we die. But that's not true of Jesus. But when Jesus left heaven, he gave that up and he came knowing that one day he would die. And he was about to face that. He was about to face a horrific beating. He was about to face insults. He was about to face all those things that none of us would ever want to face for his name. Well, I, I try not to, to let too many people know that I'm a Christian because after all, then they say things that makes me feel uncomfortable. Really? What? How uncomfortable? Do you sweat great drops of blood? Do you pray to the Father, Lord, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me? And then do you pray these words? Not my will, but your will be done. And he goes to the cross. And what God asks is a life for his life. Your life for his life. That's what he wants. Are all. And so now I pray that I've done what God has given me to do. And that's to challenge each person here today, including myself. That God's will be done in us and through us so that one day we can hear well done good and faithful servant would you bow with me please Father we are indeed grateful for the, the blessing that you have brought in Jesus not only into our lives, but to this world. And Father, we are grateful that, that the duty and the, the task of judgment is not upon our shoulders, but upon yours. And that as you provided a way back to you, that it's a simple way through the person and the sacrifice of Jesus and then Father our lives are changed in a moment because of our belief and our decision to follow and so now Father wherever wherever we are on that pathway would you spur us on would you drive us towards decision in this moment and while there are some here who may need to to enter through that that narrow gate there's so many others who are here who our task is to decide today to live for you no longer driven by our own desire our own will but the father you would have first place in our lives and then, Father, for those who are mourning and facing some sort of struggle, whether it be financial, whether it be, you know, the, a divorce that they're going through, whether it be, you know, the loss of possessions, Father, may, may they be encouraged that you keep your promises and that all you're asking us to do is to hold on a little while longer. all of our dreams all of your hopes for us will be made real where our faith becomes sight so Father may we glorify you now in 
the decision that we make this day and then the choice to follow more closely, more boldly, in a more loving way to place our lives in your hands and to look forward to the end. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.